Okay, so our next speaker is actually going to address this uh, subject. He, a good friend of mine, Jeff Kaufman, who has undertaken, I think, very successfully the, the, um, the mission of creating science to address a very unusual but uh, a deadly problem at times, and that is adenoid cystic tumors. And Jeff's going to tell us how he did it. First of all, I'd <clears throat> like to thank Bruce so much for inviting me uh, to speak before this very distinguished audience. In this uh, talk, I'd like to uh, give an overview of our five-year journey. We, we've been, actually next month will be five years uh, uh, that the Adenoid Cystic Carcinoma Research Foundation has been in existence. Um, and I want to talk about how uh, we, we've invigorated uh, what had been a, a backward, backwater of rare disease research um, by uh, developing biospecimen resources uh, and new animal models that didn't exist before uh, by identifying molecular targets um, that were specific to ACC, uh, by carrying out preclinical screening um, of targeted agents, and uh, providing uh, what, what is the endpoint of all that we're doing, which is uh, hopefully uh, a sound scientific rationale for f moving forward uh, with uh, clinical trials that have a high likelihood of success uh, in ACC. Uh, so hopefully I'll give you a sense of the challenges and the opportunities uh, in rare disease research uh, and uh, make the optimistic case that uh, hopefully patient-coordinated and assisted uh, research uh, can accelerate progress. Uh, so first, oops, no, I'm sorry, can we go back uh, one slide? Yeah. So quickly um, on statistics, i got to get them out of the way. Uh, rare diseases um, defined by the Rare Disease Act of 2002 as the diseases uh, afflicting fewer than 200,000 Americans. Uh, the paradox is that rare diseases are actually very common. There are about 30 million uh, uh, Americans, 10% uh, of the population, uh, that have uh, a rare disease, one of 7,000 rare diseases. I individually, no, no rare disease is that, uh, that, that common, clearly, um, but there are just so many of them. Uh, narrowing down on rare cancers, uh, if you leave out about the top 10 or so cancers that, that, that uh, don't meet the, uh, um, the definition of a rare disease, uh, you're still left with an enormous uh, health care burden. 25% uh, of all cancer deaths are in rare, rare cancers. 27% of all cancer diagnoses are in, are in rare cancers. Uh, you know, we know cancer is the leading cause of death um, in the United States. I mean, sorry, I apologize. Uh, heart disease is the leading cause of death in, uh, in the United States. Cancer is close behind. The thing that really struck me is that you know, if you carve out um, rare cancers from those you know, top 10 or so uh, common cancers, uh, rare cancers actually would be the third highest um, cause of death in the United States, about 5.8% of mortality. Um, so I just, you know, we, we say rare but it really is an enormous health care burden um, that, that this group of cancers have on, um, on our country. Um, but I, I am optimistic about um, a lot of, um, you know, about the prospects for rare, rare disease research and rare cancer research uh, because there's been a shifting, uh, shifting drivers of, of, of rare, rare disease research. You know, the traditional view has been um, that, you know, that uh, sorry, excuse me, yeah, there's, that uh, rare diseases you know, don't have enough available specimens, there aren't preclinical models available, it's too hard to organize the few patients and interested researchers, it's too expensive to carry out the research, not profitable enough for private industry to focus on, um, and that innovation really spills over from common diseases uh, to rare diseases. You just sit around hoping that there's a drug that works on a common disease that's going to work uh, for your rare disease. Uh, the reality you know, has shifted dramatically over the last 10 years, I think. Um, to the point where now it's the internet permits um, organization of interested parties, uh, not only for uh, raising funds, getting patients together, but also for organizing researchers. Um, uh, Levi Garraway yesterday had a chart that was, that was great that showed um, the cost of sequencing plummeting, uh, in fact, more rapidly than the cost of, um, of, of uh, you know, a semiconductor uh, power, <laughs> you know, Moore's Law. So, so we are seeing that Moore's Law does apply to a lot of basic research. Um, uh, you know, uh, for cancer, uh, we've also everyone talks about personalized medicine, and really what that what under, what's underlying that um, is the 
is that even those 10 most common cancers really are just you know, an agglomeration of lots of subsets of rare cancers. So all, all cancers are rare cancers at this point. Um, you know, the, the field is moving <laughs> towards us and, and actually it's a very, in a very positive way for rare cancers because we're looking for um, those hills that uh, uh, Levi uh, you know, was, was speaking about. Um, and clearly pharmaceutical companies you know, get that, that structural shift and are targeting p smaller and smaller patient subsets. Uh, they're seeking orphan drug designation uh, more and more. Um, and I, you know, I think it's better understood now that innovation um, often can spill over two common diseases from rare diseases. I mean, the, the, the classic is uh, classic cases um, with the, the rare familial uh, uh, cholesterol uh, diseases, where you know, the advances in the knowledge about the basic biology of cholesterol then opened up, um, you know, blockbuster opportunities uh, for cholesterol um, drugs. So quickly looking at uh, some statistics on uh, orphan drug designation, um, you know, orf there are um, over 360 drugs um, with orphan drug designation that have been approved by the FDA um, for about 200 uh, rare indications since uh, 1983. Uh, interestingly, over the last two years, about one third of all uh, new medical, uh, new molecular entity approvals uh, were, uh, well, had orphan drug designations. Um, and if you look at biologics, it's two thirds of those. So um, clearly, you know, there, there's some very powerful forces um, that are shifting the way research is being done and it's, it's seeping not only through the basic research but through uh, to the um, pharmaceutical uh, companies. So now I'd like to, um, with that backdrop, I'd like to, I would like to talk about um, ACCRF, you know, our, our, our experience. I want to have a very, very quick uh, review of the nature of the disease that we're dealing with, adenoid cystic carcinoma. Uh, it is a, a malignancy of the secretory glands, most frequently found in the salivary glands, but also mammary, lacrimal, Bartolin, sweat glands. Um, about 1,200 new cases each year, prevalence of about 10,000 patients in the United States. Uh, it's not inherited, it's not associated with, uh, with ethnicity, tobacco, um, alcohol consumption, viral infections. Slightly uh, more women than men get uh, ACC. Uh, and it, it does strike patients about 10 years, on a, uh, the median patient is about 10 years younger than the median patient for all cancers. You, you get a lot of um, young mothers in their 30s, 40s, 50s um, getting ACC, um, as was the case with our family. Uh, it has a very high propensity for uh, paraneural invasion uh, and late metastasis to the lungs. So you get five-year uh, survival rates are actually quite high, 70, 80 uh, percent. But uh, the, uh, the recurrences are, you know, are frequent, and so when you get out to 10, 15 years, you get below 40% survival. Um, the standard of care is just surgery and radiation. Uh, there have been 25 phase two uh, clinical trials in ACC, all with very, very small uh, patient numbers, and, and it's you know, very chemo resistance. There's no effective or approved uh, drugs for ACC. Uh, Quick background on our on our foundation. Uh, we've only been around you know nearly five years. Uh, uh, after my wife's diagnosis, I, I just wanted to write a check to someone and say, "Here, go do research." Um, there wasn't. It just wasn't available. There's no. You know, there, there wasn't any entity that that you could give it to that would um, do the research. We, my wife and I, decided all we could do was you know try and drive it forward ourselves. The nature of ACC is such that you do have that window uh, in which it's you know slow growing enough um, that you can. Uh, make progress, but it is serious enough eventually that you, you want to make progress. Um, so our strategy was threefold. We wanted to build a community of interested researchers that, with the help of our scientific advisory board, uh, would create an innovative research agenda, uh, and that we would mobilize patients in support uh, of that agenda by providing uh, specimens, by uh, giving, uh, giving funds uh, for research, and, for, um, and by uh, enrolling in trials. So looking at our, at our research agenda, um, we had uh, five guiding principles um, that really drove everything we did. Um, you know, the first is, you know, we're here as venture philanthropy. Uh, you know, our, our goal is to uh, bridge the valley of death, to, to get enough of a good scientific rationale and the basic and, uh, and, and preclinical uh, translational research uh, to take it to the point where uh, private in industry or, you know, or CTEP will then move on uh, with uh, clinical trials. Um, so, you know, that's, that's our job is to give good, clear scientific rationales for why a drug should work particularly well in ACC patients. Um, I don't know, for, for Monty Python fans out there, that's actually the, uh, 
uh, the bridge of death uh, <laughs> that um, uh, we're, we're, we, we often feel like we're crossing across the valley of death. But, um, uh, you know, I mentioned before my background is as a portfolio manager. Um, so uh, you know, my view of research projects is uh, you know, if there was any individual project we knew was going to give us the answer, we would put all our resources into it. Um, th that's not the way either finance works or, or uh, medical research uh, works. What we're looking to do is create a, a portfolio of projects, uh, each of which is a, you know, effectively a, a stone in a mosaic. You know, we're, there's, we're, we're trying to get signals from all these different research projects, integrate that, th those individual stones and build together a mosaic that gives a, f a fuller picture of the entire disease. Um, we're also a small foundation. Uh, you know, we, uh, don't have the luxury of passively sitting back and reviewing investigator-initiated proposals. Uh, you know, our scientific advisory board has been wonderful in proactively uh, setting the agenda, saying, you know, we know these are the these are the projects that we have to undertake uh, and get done, and we're going to go out and find the investigators uh, who have the expertise, have the interest, and the capacity to carry out those projects. And so that's um, you know been a hu huge amount of my time is, is proactively going out. Um, and selecting, uh, you know, ha having projects selected by our, our scientific advisory board, but then implementing them, making sure they happen. Uh, no single institution uh, can do all of those pieces, um, certainly not for rare diseases. So uh, it's very important, um, you know, that we get a, a, a multi-institutional uh, group that plays very, very well together in the sandbox. And, and that's difficult. It's easier for rare diseases because they all, uh, everyone knows they can't do it themselves. And lastly, uh, we do focus on accelerating practices where we can own, own the data or own the resources, you know, xenograph models or whatever, you know, we do, uh, but we require of our, our, um, our investigators to rapidly share their data, share their resources, and, and, that, and it's been fabulous. We've got a, a wonderful group of investigators. So now quickly, um, here's a schematic of our research agenda that um, you know, it hasn't changed a great deal over the last five years, but um, basically it's focused on, on three different uh, uh, categories of projects, uh, you know, the first of which is specimens and models. Uh, you know, for, for most of the diseases that you all study, it's presumed that that whole set of, uh, of, of resources are available. It's not the case with, um, with rare diseases. And in, in adenoid cystic ca carcinoma, we spent most of the first two years just trying to get biobanking um, projects up and running, create the xenographs. Um, and uh, so that, that, that took a, a huge amount of time. And basically, getting some raw material with which uh, researchers could carry out their, their, um, their studies. Uh, the second uh, category, the, s the second stratum, uh, is target and pathway identification, answering the question, you know, what, uh, what targets matter in ACC, specifically in ACC? Uh, and uh, we've undertaken um, uh, projects at a, at a wide range of, of institutions. Um, uh, DNA sequencing, uh, you know, Andy Futrell at the Sanger Institute is, is just now finishing up an exome uh, sequencing project and also uh, paired end sequencing uh, to identify rearrangements in ACC. Uh, we've also um, uh, funded various uh, ACGH studies. Uh, Steve Balin at uh, Johns Hopkins has uh, finished a, a methylation study. Um, and, you know, all just on down the line, and our, and our concept has been that what we want to do is have a consistent set of specimens and models fed through all of these different high-throughput technological platforms. So we're, we're generating data sets um, from the same samples uh, with um, you know, across high quality platforms um, that will eventually get to, you know, this bio bioinformatics area where we're going to try more and more to integrate the data. Um, and that, that's, that's our, our venture goal. I won't say that we're there by any means, but that, that's, the, that's the, the framework in which we're working. Um, and then lastly, on this third stratum of projects is translational research. Um, it's for this audience, I apologize, it's comically simplistic. And so, um, but, uh, you know, there, uh, you know, we've tried to get the targets that have been thrown up by um, that, that second tier, oops, excuse me, that second tier of projects, um, and then bring in drugs and screen them in our uh, xenograph models and, and to uh, get some preclinical um, data on the efficacy of, of uh, both approved and novel drugs. Uh, the one thing, uh, one additional point I'd make on this slide is that uh, 
we've started all these projects, we've brought together all these, these um, investigators for ACC, uh, but we've developed great relationships with the NIH. Um, uh, the, um, uh, the National Institute of Dental and Craniofacial Research, NIDCR, has taken a strong interest um, in salivary gland normal development and uh, cancers. Uh, you know, Larry Tabak was just promoted from the head of NIDCR to uh, deputy director, I believe. And uh, he's a, a, a fervent uh, leader in the, what he calls, I believe, the, the salivation army, uh, which is particularly uh, heartwarming for us. Um, uh, but uh, they've, uh, they've actually um, come, you know, partnered with us where, you know, we've gathered um, investigators uh, for bi biobanking um, project. Uh, NIDCR has backfilled that for not only ACC, but all salivary gland tumors. So they've given $5 million uh, for that project. Uh, we had started uh, a project in which uh, we were developing xenograft models, you know, low passage, fresh human tumor xenograft models. Uh, again, NIDCR came along and funded two uh, challenge grants uh, to, to develop um, uh, xenograft models for all salivary gland cancers. So um, they're, they're coming and backfilling the effort, you know, the, the groups that we've, we've seeded um, and, and broadened them. Uh, likewise, they're doing that with um, a lot of the genomic and proteomic studies um, that we started at the Sanger Institute and other institutes. Uh, well, I think I've mentioned some of these um, institutions, but th this is our community of, of researchers that, that has developed. Um, we've got folks at the University of Virginia, MD Anderson, uh, Hopkins, Farber, Mass General, uh, gosh, um, Cell Signaling, um, UCSF, even Sweden, um, so at Gothenburg University. So th this, is, um, this is how I spend my days, is, is trying to build this community. Um, and uh, you know, it, the history has been um, very focused on that basic research, and it's taken me a long time to, to try to understand the, the, the complexity of what, all, what you all do every day. Uh, but as we're moving closer and closer to the clinic, uh, I'm finding that the complexity is even greater, and I, I need to have an even steeper learning curve uh, for, uh, for understanding clinical trials. And uh, you know, I look at the 25 clinical trials that have been done in ACC, um, and honestly, I, you know, I, I, there's not a single, you know, there's one of the 25 where I could say that I understand the scientific rationale for why that clinical, why that drug should work in ACC. Um, the rest, you know, honestly, it's, it's crop dusting. Uh, you know, it's the, there are too few ACC patients out there that, you know, we can't waste our, that valuable resource um, with, without having, you know, intelligently targeted drugs. I mean, it, it's particularly in rare cancer um, communities, you know, we need personalized medicine um, in order to, to take advantage of the, you know, the few opportunities we have to find, uh, find better medicines. Uh, so uh, this is a framework that I've put together uh, and try and educate myself and, and p other patients as we, as we go out and try and you know, increase uh, trial accrual. And it's putting together you know, rationales for why a drug should work just in ACC or our particular disease. Um, and I've grouped them you know, in three broad areas, uh, mechanism of action, uh, which is really that, you know, Bruce, who's on our SAB, you know, has always driven that point home. Let's, let's focus on the basic biology of the disease. Let's, let's uh, understand the mechanisms of action, and that's going to be the highest quality projects and the, the you know, highest return projects that we can um, invest in. Um, and, you know, in there, there, but even within mechanisms of action, there, there are very, very different levels of, of evidence there. Uh, you know, a lot of the... the uh, there was great hope that imatinib would work uh, in ACC because 90% of ACCs overexpress seek it. Um, but you know there are thousands of, of genes that are overexpressed in, <laughs> in ACC, and it, you know and it, it's 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 great that uh, you know there's overexpression um, of seek it. But, but uh, you know later studies um, that you know, confirmed that there's no phosphorylation of seek it uh, in ACCs. Um, and uh, you know and and then when we we tested the drugs in our in our mouse models. It confirmed what we already knew from the clinic, which is that you know this isn't a drug that's going to that's going to impact ACC patients. Um, so what we're looking to do is build you know additional layers of certainty that a that a uh, that a drug is going to work. Um, so we're looking at phosphorylation, uh, identifying DNA alterations, and eventually getting to the functional studies that will lay out the pathways and networks that matter in a specifically for ACC. Uh, we also have set up a, a platform for preclinical screening, um, and you know, 
the, the reality is that, you know, so the, the top two um, categories are really the ones in which, you know, we have the greatest faith. The fact is, is there are some, there are partial responses in phase one trials, and, you know, there are some trials that have moved forward based on that, and, and certainly we want to follow up on those, and, and we have. Um, so j just to, to summarize it, you know, the, the simplistic trial, clinical trial map that's in my brain is, is simply, you know, we're here to, to provide strong scientific rationales for clinical trials. We're going to get, pre, we're going to provide supporting preclinical data, um, and out of that you're going to hopefully get excitement from industry uh, to proceed with the trials. Uh, just as importantly, you're going to get excitement among the patient community to enroll in those trials, and that's how we're going to be successful. Um, so now I just spend a, a few minutes on on the levels of evidence, uh, well, particularly mechanisms of action in ACC. Um, and what we, as I said, we, we've generated a lot of these data sets, and we're just now starting to try to integrate them. One of the simplest things you could do is, you know, a Venn diagram of, you know, look at what are the, what are the targets that are, you know, overlapping in the various um, data sets. And, and we have identified, um, uh, you know, FGFR1 is a target of interest, IGF1R as well. Um, and, you know, our, our hope is that we're going <laughs> to undertake much more sophisticated analyses going forward. Um, what was nice is that these were, these were unbiased studies. You know, you looked at all gene expression. We looked at the, the whole kinome, um, actually the tyrosines, I'm sorry, uh, for the phosphorylation. And um, uh, that's how we came up with those targets. Totally in parallel, we had another funded researcher uh, in Sweden who identified a recurrent translocation in ACCs. Uh, and it, it basically is a T69 translocation, which um, involves uh, the MIB gene, which is a known oncogene, uh, and NFIB. Uh, and what happens is, is the uh, negative regulatory domain of MIB is lost in the fusion. And so these microRNAs that dock and, and stop, you know, downregulate MIB um, are no longer there. So you, it's, there's, a, you know, there's, a, uh, MIB is one of the most overexpressed um, uh, uh, genes in, in uh, ACC. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so we're, we've funded studies to identify the prevalence of, of this fusion across much larger cohorts. Um, and it looks like it's probably going to be, you know, a solid majority of ACCs are going to have this fusion gene. Um, but interestingly, even the fusion negative uh, cases of ACC um, also overexpress uh, MIB. So there may be an alternative mechanism by which uh, MIB is overexpressed. Um, you know, we, we uh, you know, functional studies are underway. Uh, and also, uh, you know, uh, we've got some efforts to create transgenic models. Uh, Kwok Wong at the Farber, uh, Gigi Lozano at MD Anderson, and Inder Verma at the Salk Institute are all involved with different approaches to try and create uh, transgenic models um, of ACC. Uh, so, so we believe, it's, it's by no means certain, but we think we found the likely driver um, of ACC. And so what we, you know, the, the comprehensive long-term strategy is to try and go after the driver, which is MIB, but, you know, it's a transcription factor, very difficult to drug. Um, you know, we are exploring um, a, a staple peptide approach. Um, but, you know, in the interim, we have to follow an opportunistic strategy and look at the downstream targets of MIB. You know, there are 16 known downstream targets, 14 of which are overexpressed in most ACCs. Um, and uh, so, so, you know, that's kind of where we're focused on. Um, and sure enough, the, you know, one of the, the, um, one of the uh, targets is uh, yeah, FGF2, which is, um, uh, you know, ligand for uh, uh, FGFR1, which we had identified from our unbiased studies previously. So that was, that was um, encouraging. Um, but we need to identify uh, more downstream targets. We're going to do chip seek um, studies and so forth to do that and, and um, sort of methodically work our way through the rational targets. Um, quick point on uh, preclinical models. Uh, when we started um, the foundation, I gathered all the uh, cell lines that I could find that were published in the literature. Uh, we disseminated them to our, our community of interested researchers. Um, I got back from three separate researchers. Um, uh, comments that they had uh, undertaken STR profiling. It turned out all of the cell lines uh, were misidentified. We had three HeLa cells, a bladder cancer cell line, uh, 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 there was a urine tumor in there. Um, so 
uh, you know, I was devastated at the time, but the fact is, is we cleaned up the field. The fact that there are all sorts of uh, conclusions that were be ma being made about ACC uh, that were invalid, and uh, the good news is, is that at least those aren't, those aren't proceeding. Uh, we did uh, also in parallel um, focus on xenograft models, creating, creating these models, um, and what we've done is we've hired a CRO to centralize them all, to expand them, establish them, uh, and uh, we've completed five baseline str uh, screens of 40 anti-cancer agents across all those models um, uh, to, to try and get a sense of, well, how sensitive or insensitive are each of these models, and then we can evaluate novel agents against those baselines. Um, so this is, uh, this is a, uh, a, a summary. Uh, it's an average tumor growth inhibition um, across all five of um, the, the uh, baseline models that uh, we carried out uh, in our xenograph models. Uh, this is only the approved agents. We couldn't uh, put in the, the novel agents. Um, but you can see that actually the um, you know, only, only dose of Taxil shows up as, as really significantly active in, on average in our models. Um, pretty, the rest uh, are pretty much in line with what we've seen in the clinic, which is that they're really, uh, you know, these models are resistant uh, to most of these therapies, just like uh, uh, in the clinic. Uh, I know I'm, I'm running late here, so let me, let me hurry. Uh, so to trying to tie it all together, what are we trying to do? Um, what we want to uh, move forward are the highest, um, uh, those clinical trials that have the highest likelihood of success that, uh, that have the highest levels of evidence. So, you know, what I've, what I've listed here are actually there are eight clinical trials that, at, that are open for ACC patients at the moment. And what we've done is sort of graded them across mechanisms of action, preclinical screening, and clinical anecdotes. Um, and what you see is that, you know, the 25 studies that were done previously, but even the current studies that are open, there really is not a clear scientific rationale for why, why um, any of these drugs should be working in ACC. Um, we've been in dis discussions um, you know, based on our our, our basic and translational research, um, you know, getting in drugs from various companies uh, and screening them in our mod in our uh, xenograft models, and we we're moving forward um, with a, uh, a trial in um, Davitinib, which is an FGFR. Well, it's a multi-kinase um, inhibitor, uh, but then it includes an FGFR1 as as one of its targets. And you know, by no means do I feel any certainty that this is. Um, you know, definitely going to work. But I just think that the, the likelihood of success is right. It's, it is higher. Um, this is the approach that we want to take. You know, we think it's right for the patients. It's right for the for private industry. This is the way that we're going to move forward um, uh, in the best manner. Uh, we do uh, want to continually improve our you know, continuous data improvement. Um, we're generating these, these data sets, um, and uh, we're trying to integrate them all. Uh, but just one thing that was interesting from our, our xenograft data is uh, here I have the tumor growth inhibition across these five ACC xenograft models, and we've got the, the, the top performing drugs, you know, on average. Um, and, that, and that's interesting, and, you know, definitely I think docetaxel might be worth looking, um, looking at uh, in the clinic. Uh, but also what's perhaps more interesting is if you look at the, you know, the average TGI of serafinib was only 45%, not very impressive at all. Um, but what would be more interesting is to look at those cases. There were actually three cases in which there was pretty good activity in serafinib and two cases that were, where um, there was actually you know, no activity. Um, and so the, the type of um, studies we want to undertake is to, to try and um, correlate the, effic the drug efficacy uh, with the genomic profile, and, and that's sort of the wave of the future of what we're hoping to do. The other thing that we're going to do with all these um, data sets that we're generating, um, you know, there's already a, a, a sort of pilot data set sitting on the Sanger's uh, cosmic portal, uh, but over the next couple of three months, the exome sequencing data across 25 ACCs is going to be put out there, and so that will all be publicly available. Uh, the University of Virginia has um, a also very extensive data set for the xenografts and some primary tumors. That's also out there um, and will be, um, you know, is widely available. So, you know, our hope is that put the data out there and, you know, let a thousand flowers bloom. Let, let, let people uh, work with the data. So um, just in conclusion, you know, we've spent five years almost um, and about $3 million, and what did we get for it? Um, I think we've, we've actually gotten quite a bit for uh, what I would view as you know, relatively modest investment. 
um, in a rare disease research. Uh, we've gotten over 200 uh, frozen specimens in our biobanks. Uh, we, <laughs> we invalidated all the pre-existing cell lines. I guess that's an advance. Uh, we've characterized and uh, created and cra characterized about 15 human tumor xenografts and completed uh, five baseline screens. Uh, we've gotten NIDCR to, to uh, co-fund with us $12 million in, in projects. Um, and uh, we've identified a likely driver uh, translocation. We, we're in the process of creating transgenic mouse models, uh, with generating a, a ream of, of genomic and proteomic data. And we've gotten to the point where uh, I think we have the first uh, clinical trial in ACC with a, you know, a, a clear scientific rationale supported by preclinical data. Um, so uh, lessons uh, for rare disease research. Um, I do think it's important to try and organize a community of interested investigators. I think as patient advocacy organizations, we have a special place um, in which you know, we have, we're able to use our moral suasion and our full-time focus on it. You know, e even looking at our community, maybe there's three, three to five investigators who spend 25% of their time on ACC. There, you know, we don't have anybody other than us that's full-time um, on ACC. Um, but I, so I think for rare diseases, you need that that central gathering point. Um, uh, the second point I'd make is you got to be friendlier to the pathologists. They are just so crucial to everything that's going on um, to, to get the specimens, but also to, you know, to analyze them to um, later for the diagnostics and so forth. You know, I, I, I think that, you know, I look at, uh, at the way that um, the relations uh, between pathology and other, <laughs> other disciplines is, is at a lot of institutions, and you know, we've been just very, very fortunate that we've got a very collaborative group, and I think that that's been essential to everything. Um, as I said before, uh, the primacy of focusing on the mechanisms of action, um, that, that's crucial. And the other thing that I found is in talking to uh, private industry, uh, you know, you know, they don't want to, they're not here to cure ACC, they're here to talk about targets, and, and to, you know, and, then, and that's the way you've got to approach um, rare disease research is not to say, oh, you know, oh me, oh my, please, you know, help me. Uh, you've got to sit, you got to be you know, hard-nosed about it and say, look, these are the targets that matter in, in our disease, and this is the rationale why you should move forward. So final slide, um, it's just, you know, you all put up the slides of uh, the acknowledgments, and, uh, you know, we don't have a lab, you know, I don't personally <laughs> have a lab, but, but I do have um, uh, the heroes that, uh, that, you know, we're, we're very, very thankful for uh, everything that they've done. And, um, you know, our scientific advisor board has been absolutely so committed, so helpful. And, uh, you know, Bruce has been fabulous um, in that, uh, in, in giving us guidance, so we appreciate it. Um, and we've also gotten, you know, an extended community of probably about 20 to 30 um, researchers, but there really is a corner, there, there are six cornerstones of our research effort, and you can see their names up there, um, and we're so appreciative of all their help. So thank you very much. Sorry, I ran over. <laughs> I think it's a very important uh, exercise, what you're doing, bringing these people together uh, in this rare disease. Now, you picked ACC today, and that's a disease where when it's metastatic, it may grow very slowly or not grow mm -hmm. for 10 years or 15 years. Mm -hmm. And it would be very important with your many centers or the people involved to try to understand why these metastases don't grow. Um, uh, you are doing genetic studies in these tumors, you are doing, but there must be a reason why they don't grow, and I think that it would be worthwhile for other diseases to understand why this disease does grow so slowly. Yeah, no, I, I agree, and it, you know, it could well be that there, you know, there's a lot of the studies on senescence and you know, you know, late metastasis that you know, you know, we, need to, we need to focus more on and understand better. And it may and it'd be interesting whether it's ACC specific or applicable perhaps to all you know, cancers in, in the same way. So that, that could be a, a way in which we learn something more broadly about other more common cancers. Jeff, uh, congratulations on the vision and leadership that you've shown because uh, I think what you've achieved in five years is absolutely outstanding. Um, you didn't talk about education as a, an important component of the foundation and, and I'm just going to pose the question as 
someone who remembers the first time as an attending physician he came across the patient with adenocystic and scratched his head and went, where the hell is that in the literature? <laughs> and, and the problem for clinicians and for oncologists, indeed surgeons, is that they very rarely see these patients. And mm -hmm. my uh, view would be that both the physician and the patient are lost when this diagnosis happens initially. So I just wonder whether the foundation has thought about um, you know, the whole idea of instructing the patient and the physician as to A, what the best approach may be. You talked about a joined up clinical trial strategy because I remember when I reviewed the literature 15 years ago, the largest collection I could find I think was a memorial with 10 patients. Mm -hmm. you know, so maybe could I hear your thoughts on that? Yeah, no, absolutely, and it's um, what we've, uh, what we're actually on the cusp of doing is uh, putting out some more educational materials uh, for well-informed patients, but also for you know, physicians who haven't come run across ACC very often. And, and actually, in the next uh, week or two, uh, we're going to have a document out that will review the history of all past clinical trials, uh, the currently open trials, um, and potential molecular targets. And, and the whole point is education. Um, and so, you know, we realize it's a, it, it's, it's a, a I, yeah. I don't know if my microphone is on, but it's a remarkable document. Uh, I've read it, and I, I just am uh, in awe of what Jeff has put together as a layperson. If he knew that much about bonds as he knows about <laughs> ACC, he, he would have been a remarkable fin uh, financial advisor, and I'm sure he was. Um, <laughs> I think we should think, actually, Jeff, if, you, if you're amenable to this, about putting this online as part of your presentation, and we could do that, because I think it's, it's the best, most comprehensive discussion of the disease and, and its potential for therapeutic intervention that I've seen. In fact, Bruce, uh, that was going to be my point. Why is it you take my point? <laughs> Jeff, it's true, we do. Jeff, truly, uh, uh, I was just going to not only suggest about uh, putting this uh, virally online, but also one of your greatest uh, advantages, I, I should think, of recent years has been the, uh, the friendship that you must have with Amy Doxer Marcus mm -hmm. of the Wall Street Journal, who uh, the Pulitzer Prize winning journalist uh, for her series of articles, front page page one in the Wall Street Journal on cancer in general until her mother was diagnosed with a rare cancer that then her editor said, we want you to look into and do something about. Subsequently, as you know, she became a fellow and went to the NIH and so forth and so on. But there is now, through the media is my point, mm -hmm. an opportunity not only to express the pathos and significance mm -hmm. of the individual patient, however few they may be, but to say this is a marvelous and incredible opportunity of experience to learn from these unusual diseases, but in great depth uh, for a host of other reasons as well. Yeah, I would just say, yeah, Amy is a, actually a nearby neighbor of ours and has become a very close friend, so um, you're absolutely right. Um, but I also don't want to say that we're the only um, sort of research-oriented patient advocacy group out there. There, there's, there really is a grass, grassroots bubbling up of similar organizations um, like the Cordoma Foundation, um, you know, uh, the Caring for Carcinoid and others, where uh, there are um, patients who, you know, really are looking to grasp the reins, in, you know, not in a confrontational way, but in a supportive way, as supportive a way as we can possibly be, um, you know, of the wonderful work that you all are capable of doing. Um, and that's, you know, we want to make it easy for you to, to look across, you know, a broader range of, of diseases, including the rare diseases. And, and absolutely, we will be raising the profile over time. <laughs> I would just invite everybody who's interested in this subject to talk to uh, Jeff over lunch. Uh, I'm sorry we don't have enough uh, time to c continue the conversation, but thank you so much, Jeff, for the presentation. Thank you.